السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أحب نرحب بكم في اجتماعنا هذا for the second thyroid society meeting and today is our fourth session of the second thyroid society meeting for this year today we are having eminent speakers who are going to talk about important topics our first speaker will be Dr. Anwar Jamah Dr. Anwar Jamah is an associate professor of medicine and endocrinology. He is uh, a graduate from King Saud University and he uh, attained his training in, in Canada where he got his FRCBC. And uh, he is now practicing as a consultant endocrinologist at King Khalid University Hospital, King Saud University. Uh, Dr. Jamah is well known to everybody and his talk will be about approach to the management of benign thyroid nodule. What's the update? Dr. Jamah, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Saleh. Um, uh, I'm really glad to, uh, to be a part of uh, this meeting with uh, Abu Nabil and with you. And uh, also I want to thank the uh, organizing committee and uh, Dr. Nasser uh, Al-Juhani. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, in my talk uh, uh, about talking about thyroid nodule in general, how to approach it. Then we will uh, go ahead and talk about the management of the benign uh, thyroid uh, nodule. Okay, so uh, thyroid nodule, as uh, most of us uh, know as endocrinology, is one of the most, uh, most uh, common uh, referring uh, problem. And actually, it's similar to the uh, to diabetes, and sometimes it's more. The annual ans incident of the thyroid nodule is actually a 0.1 percent. That will give all uh, about 350,000 uh, new nodules in in a country like United States. It's increased with the age, and the um, increment by of the incident 0.1 percent per year. It's four folds higher in female, so it's a, uh, most of our patients are female, young female. And uh, the, uh, uh, more importantly is the outcome of this uh, thyroid nodules. Five percent of them are uh, malignant, and uh, five to ten percent are autonomous, or uh, causing hyperthyroidism, or thyrotoxicosis. Uh, so it's, uh, as we said, it's a prevalent uh, disease, and uh, if we use the hand or uh, using the palpation to find the thyroid nodule, we can find 7% of all population with thyroid nodule. So it's by palpation, 7%. However, if we use the ultrasound, which is, we'll find more thyroid nodule. We'll find 30 to up to 70%. Uh, thyroid nodule in in in, uh, in the sample that we are testing. Um, that's uh, known that's 40 percent of the patient with a single barrel nodule that you will find another nodule by the ultrasound. The uh, only 40 percent of the nodule are barrel, and that's the nodule more than one centimeter. So that's showing you the evidence. Uh, uh, the, sorry, the prevalence of the thyroid nodule and the association of that with the age. So um, increasing the age will result in increase the uh, uh, prevalence of thyroid nodule. This is a, a, a slide from Mazafiri, that's a well-known slide, talking about the differential diagnosis of thyroid nodule, can be uh, benign or uh, uh, cancer and it can be cystic lesion, colloid nodule, or uh, thyroiditis or gr uh, granulomatous disease. So why we care about thyroid nodule? Why, why it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to talk about thyroid nodule? What's the concern of uh, the physician? What's the concern of the, of the uh, patient? Actually, number one is uh, being malignant nodule, and that's found, as we said, 5% of the nodule. And uh, however, it's, it's, it's uh, the, the post-bottom 
uh, case in Syria is found that almost 6% of uh, dead people have uh, uh, microcarcinoma. The other concern of thyroid nodule is the autonomous function. So autonomous nodule that can cause thyrotoxicosis. It's up to 5 to 10% of the uh, whole thyroid nodule. Thyroid cancer is, is a very common disease. That, that's why we uh, uh, have uh, uh, the concern about thyroid nodule. And it's, it's number one th cancer in age between 15 to, uh, to 29. And it's actually number two from between 30 to 44. And overall, it's number three uh, among all the other cancers. It's a disease of young uh, females, so it's the increment of, um, of the uh, increase of the uh, incident is increased by, from the age of 20 to 24. That's reached to the uh, peak of that. <clears throat> Um, one of the things that we learned that more ultrasound you do, more thyroid cancer you found, and that's a, a famous uh, uh, study that showing increase the incidence of thyroid cancer, and that's because of the, uh, the screening program by the ultrasound, and that was uh, uh, not associated with any increase in mortality. Uh, however, we uh, uh, have more thyroid cancer diagnosis, most of it is papillary thyroid cancer, and most of this is uh, actually microcarcinoma, had no uh, very significant uh, uh, impact in the uh, patient life. So that, uh, we said that's most common cancer or thyroid cancer is the papillary thyroid carcinoma. So how we evaluate a patient with thyroid nodule? So uh, initial evaluation of the thyroid nodule start by history and examination, the history, um, mainly two or three questions that uh, we always uh, want to ask, the family history of thyroid cancer, the history of ionized radiation in the childhood or adolescent, age less than 20 or more than 70, male sex, and growing nodule, that's important uh, question that we ask the patient for. We also ask about the functional abnormality, hyper hyperthyroidism, and we always ask about compression symptoms of breathing and swallowing problem. Radiation exposure, we, uh, we uh, have this question in our clinic uh, every day uh, about the exposure to X-ray and uh, CT scan. And uh, there's the, the study that uh, uh, coming from Chernobyl, uh, nuclear, nuclear power uh, uh, release uh, in 1986, showed that the increment or the increase of the thyroid cancer uh, from the radiation, actually, uh, uh, is is uh, is uh, uh, if 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 the if the person have the exposure from zero or from infancy to age of nineteen. After age of nineteen, the uh, if the exposure to radiation has almost uh, very small impact on the uh, uh, on the risk of having thyroid. Uh, cancer. So if people came and have uh, x-ray or CT scan after uh, age of 20 or even if you have uh, radiation therapy after age of uh, 19 or 20, uh, the risk of thyroid cancer is very small. However, we know that the risk of having thyroiditis or thyroid nodule caused by thyroiditis is, is high. But for cancer per se, it's uh, almost... Uh, but uh, neglectable, very small. In the examination, we like to ask about firm, the heart of the our heart nodule, the fixed nodule. We have to uh, examine the cervical lymphadenopathy and uh, look for the sign of hyper hyperthyroidism and sign of compression. Uh, in the examination uh, of the uh, uh, thyroid of the neck, we uh, always uh, think about where is this patient come from. So if the patient coming from iodine depleted area, you, you will find his uh, thyroid small from 10 to 20 gram. If the patient coming from the iodine deficient area, you may find a normal thyroid uh, for them up to 35 uh, gram. So it can be easily palpable. Um, as we mentioned that uh, the ability of physician to find the thyroid nodule 
is uh, is uh, uh, if the tire nodule is more than one centimeter, and if the size is increased, that will be easier to uh, to find uh, the nodule. I know some some of the uh, patient, uh, some of the physician who is dealing with uh, thyroid uh, disease or thyroid uh, uh, nodule, uh, they may find up to 0 0.8, 0 0.7 centime uh, centimeter thyroid nodule in the examination. They can feel it. Uh, initial investigation, we usually do the thyroid function test, and we, sometimes we do the antibodies, and uh, we do the calcitonin for the high-risk patients. It's not recommended to do a, the calcitonin for, uh, for everybody. Um, you do the TSH. If the TSH is uh, normal or high, that means we have to do the ultrasound, and the, we do the FNA if the nodule is seen in the ultrasound, and meet certain criteria that we're going to talk in uh, fast about it. If the TSH is low, you do the t thyroid scan, technetium or iodine, and, and if there is a cold nodule or cold area, you do the ultrasound and you uh, do the same approach for it. If there is no cold uh, area or if there is hot area, that means this patient has uh, have very low risk to have thyroid cancer, no need to do uh, FNA, and you uh, treat the patient accordingly. Um, I summarize here the uh, risk factor of clinical risk factor and investigation risk factor. So as we said, the family history, the male gender, the age less than 20 or more than 70, growing nodule, firm or hard nodule in examination, and there is a cervical, pathological cervical lymph node. Uh, that's all uh, considered a high risk factor for the thyroid cancer. And investigation that if the TSH is high, the calcitonin is more than 100, for MTC, or if there is high risk feature in the ultrasound, there's a cold nodule in the thyroid uh, scan, there's bit and uh, uh, FDG, a bit scan positive thyroid nodule that's also increased the risk of thyroid cancer. And if the patient have genetic test or have positive molecular, certain molecular uh, uh, finding. This is a study that's showing that increase the TSH for finding patient with thyroid nodule who has a high TSH that's increased the prevalence of malignancy. And at the same time, actually, it's increased the stages of the cancer. So they have more cancer, and if they have cancer, the uh, stage of the cancer will be advanced and, uh, uh, and have more uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, thyroid cancer. Now this is the showing the same thing that the TSH is going up the uh, patient with uh, the, uh, thyroid cancer or advanced thyroid cancer will be more with higher TSH. So that's showing also uh, the same thing that uh, if the TSH is less than 0 0.3, the risk of the uh, cancer of the thyroid nodule is almost 8.1. This is one of the study. And it's actually almost double or more than double if the TSH is more than five. So the other risk factor is the uh, uh, the cold nodule in the iodine scan. And uh, as we mentioned, if, the, if there is a cold nodule in the iodine scan or in the technetium scan, that will increase the risk of cancer by almost 30%, up to 30%. Um, a cold nodule uh, in either way is, is high risk. The hot nodule is, is uh, if it's in the iodine, that's very small risk to have, uh, to have the uh, cancer. However, the hot nodule in technetium doesn't mean anything uh, in, in regard to uh, thyroid cancer. So the risk of thyroid nodule will be the same, 5%, even if it's hot in a technetium scan. If the uh, uh, GBET scan, if you have a positive, and sometimes you have this referral, um, maybe twice a month, they have a positive bit in the thyroid, you do ultrasound, you do the FNA, it's can cancer, and the risk is there. So if it's positive in bit scan, the risk of having cancer is high in 3 to 35%. And the cancer is always, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes, uh, or it's more aggressive if it's positive uh, bit scan. <clears throat> ultrasound of the thyroid is actually one of the most important tests uh, detect the thyroid lesion, it's measure it accurately, you can follow it up uh, with very accurate measurement and uh, 
and you can have a full up plan for any thyroid nodule. You can evaluate the cervical lymph nodes uh, with, 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 with high accuracy. Ultrasound should not be performed as screening test. As, as we mentioned in the maybe third or fourth slide, um, that's showing this, uh, that's the uh, Korea when they do the ultrasound screening for everybody, they found more uh, thyroid cancer. Uh, and it's, most of it's not significantly uh, impact their life. So indication for thyroid for the thyroid's ultrasound should be restricted to the high risk patient, patient with palpable thyroid nodule, or patient with a cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, size doesn't matter. So the small nodule have the same risk of the large nodule uh, of uh, having cancer. Um, uh, some some study that's showing this maybe a difference, but actually the uh, risk of the cancer didn't depend on the size of the nodule. Um, however, the stages of the disease, the advance of the disease, the aggressiveness of the disease is related to the size, but for the uh, diagnosis per se, that the size doesn't matter. Again, the number of the nodule doesn't matter. So the risk of having one nodule to have a thyroid cancer in one patient in one nodule is the same of this uh, one patient with multiple nodules. So multiplicity of the nodule doesn't matter also. Okay, so in the ultrasound, this is very important to know what's the uh, risk. I'm not going to go in detail of this, but uh, um, you have the ATA uh, scoring system, the high suspicious, the intermediate, the low suspicious, the very low suspicious, the benign. Um, because of my talk today, we talking about benign. So the pure cyst is definitely benign. The sponge form is benign. If you have a cyst, mainly cyst, and there's a small amount of uh, solid area or comet tail, that's also a uh, very benign feature. Once you have microcalcification, irregular border, um, invasion to the other structure, um, uh, the uh, hypoclusity, uh, uh, that's all increase the risk of thyroid cancer to be uh, there in this nodule. So this is one of the uh, things that we are not using it anymore, so no longer consider uh, as a risk factor, which is the hypervascularity of the nodule. Uh, because many thyroid uh, nodule hyperfunctioning, or if there is uh, acute inflammation uh, uh, of the uh, of the nodule, it can cause <clears throat> hypervascularity. So the hypervascularity is not important anymore in the uh, thyroid nodule risk factor uh, as risk factor for a thyroid cancer and thyroid nodule. Suspicious uh, lymph node is very important. So if there is microcalcification, if there is cystic finding in the, nodule, in the uh, lymph nodes, there is a peripheral vascularity, hyperecogenicity or round shaped nodule or lymph, uh, sorry, lymph, uh, lymph nodes, uh, that increase the risk of having cancer uh, at, uh, at this uh, lymph node. So um, we have the ATA risk assessment by the ultrasound and you have, uh, if you have high or intermediate you have to biopsy the nodule more than one centimeter. If you have low suspicious pattern, you biopsy more than one and a half centimeter. If you have low suspicious, you have to biopsy if it's only more than two centimeter. And uh, if you have benign pattern, you don't need to do the FNA. Um, so basically there is no FNA for less than one centimeter. And you start to biopsy, one centimeter if you are having high suspicious or intermediate suspicious, 1.5 for low suspicious and very low if it's more than two centimeter only. This is um, uh, American thyroid. So, so we have the first one, which is the ATA uh, assessment. We have the American thyroid uh, uh, assessment also. This is by a radiologist. It's giving point. And you have the European uh, uh, thyroid also, and that's also trying to uh, give a risk assessment uh, or radiological assistance or ultrasound uh, risk assessment 
of the nodule to consider uh, the FNA or not to consider it or to choose when to do the uh, FNA. Um, there is a, a, a clear guidelines for most of this uh, 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 risk assessment uh, protocols. Five minutes, um, Dr. Nauru. Yes. Uh, are you, Dr. Saleh, you hear me? Yeah, five minutes. Okay, so uh, I think I'll, I'll speed up here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you can do the ultras, uh, FNA for everybody, but uh, you, you cannot train the monkey not to do the FNA. Um, so that's what I'm doing. I'm uh, uh, doing the same thing here, uh, using one of the uh, risk assessment uh, 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 guidelines and do it uh, the ultrasound. We are doing the ultrasound by, uh, so we're doing the FNA by the ultrasound. We are no longer doing the uh, FNA blindly. As you see in this video, you, you can do the FNA for this nodule, and this is the carotid, and this will be impossible to be done without the ultrasound guidance. Um, so how we do with the uh, thyroid nodule, uh, I have to go over all of this. This is the in, in, indeterminate nodule, and we'll, we will stop in the... Okay, so treatment option for a benign nodule. So treatment option for a benign nodule, we are use why we treat benign nodule. If there is a local pain, if there is a pressure symptom, or if the patient is anxious or... Uh, fear from this cancer. And the treatment option here, we have non-invasive option and invasive option. So simple observation, it can be considered as one of the treatment option. T4 suppression test, uh, uh, suppression treatment, we're giving them thyroxine and follow the thyroid nodule. And we have the invasive, either by surgery or minimally invasive, either by using the percutaneous uh, ethanol injection or radio frequency ablation, laser or microwave uh, We'll talk about the first two, uh, inshallah. So uh, observation, if the patient have uh, a thyroid nodule, we did the biopsy, it's benign, and there is a low to intermediate suspicious in the ultrasound better, you follow it in 12 months. If you have high suspicions, you can follow the uh, ultrasound in six months, and you can actually repeat the FNA in six months. There is no need to do uh, any follow-up if the patient have low suspicious ultrasound better. Uh, most benign nodules remain this stable, and you have only, you need to repeat the FNA if there is increase in 20% uh, at one of the dimension, or more than 50% change in the volume, or develop new suspicious ultrasound feature. You have to remember always that benign nodules can increase in volume by up to 50% yearly. Um, I'll, I'll just try to make it short here that T4 suppression is not any more important. We learned um, many years ago that it's decreased the volume by uh, less than 50% in only 20% of the treated patients. And most of the study actually showed less than this even. Uh, so most of the guidelines, it's uh, abandoned now. There's, the, there's no recommendation to use the suppressive therapy to benign nodule. Surgery is, is the one of the options that we use uh, uh, to uh, remove the nodule or benign nodule if there is pressure symptoms. The minimally invasive images, there is no, uh, this is a non-surgical alternative to treat thyroid nodule. The, uh, it's offered by experienced team, it should be experienced team that's doing this. Uh, the nodule should be confirmed as benign, not only by one FNA, should be by two. You can have only one single benign nodule if the, uh, uh, if the ultrasound feature of the if, if very benign, so sponge pore or pure cyst, you may need only one uh, FNA. Um, not, uh, this is a, a survey we did, I think you, it's, it's reached to you, and it's uh, surprisingly the most of our uh, endocrinologists are uh, tend to uh, to go to send patient for surgery for benign nodule if needed uh, to be removed. Only 17% sent for alcohol 
injection for cystic nodule and 3.4 for solid nodule uh, for a radio frequency ablation. So ethanol injection is actually is, uh, is very good for a cystic nodule and uh, it's up to 80% of the cyst decrease by one injection and the symptom improve immediately. It's, uh, it's, it's very uh, effective treatment. It's very low cost and it can cause only mild uh, pain and transient uh, pain. It's, it's very rare actually. It, it, the procedure is the same like thyroid nodule. We inject uh, we uh, we uh, insert the needle, we aspirate the fluid, and we inject less than fifty percent of the amount of uh, of the of the fluid that we extracted. Uh, but we inject it with ethanol, ninety nine percent or ninety eight percent, so lots of alcohol there to shrink the. We have to use the ultrasound always. Imagine this is actually not a cyst. This is actually the jugular. This is the carotid, and this is a uh, thyroid cyst. This is showing the uh, effect of alcohol over 12 months. The nodule is almost disappeared. Um, it's very successful uh, uh, for uh, if you compare it to saline. And uh, as, as we mentioned, most of the patients will use only one injection, sometimes two injections to uh, take care of the uh, thyroid cyst. Uh, actually, it's not. We don't use it for a solid nodule. Rarely we use it. It's not performed. We prefer to send for surgery. And if the surgery is contraindication and indicated or is unpreferable by the patient, radio, radio frequency ablation will do the job for the solid nodule. Uh, uh, this is showing the effect of the alcohol in injection for radio frequency ablation. I think. I think there is a. Uh, a lecture uh, next week about this. Uh, however, the, uh, if you compare the radio frequency ablation with alcohol in in a cystic thyroid nodule, the uh, uh, this is in a uh, 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 Korean uh, study. Uh, well, actually, it's um, guidelines and the uh, 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 assess many st study that's showing the alcohol or ethanol injection was superior to radio frequency ablation in treating cystic nodule, less expensive and fewer number of treatment sessions uh, if you compare it with radio frequency ablation. The solid nodule is, is better if you are going to use minimally invasive radio frequency ablation is better for the solid nodule. And uh, so in summary, um, minimally invasive procedure, uh, you have to have at least two benign FNA before you send patient for minimally invasive procedure. Uh, especially for the nodule that's with high risk in the ultrasound. Uh, for cystic or mixed nodule, uh, percutaneous ethanol injection is the best option. For solid nodule surgery or radiofrequency ablation can be used. We are not using, uh, for myself and uh, most of the people that I know, that, that we are not using the ethanol uh, too much in the, in the, in the solid nodule. Uh, actually, it needs uh, uh, good training and experience in doing this. And uh, this is my last slide. Thank you. Dr. Saleh. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anwar, for an excellent talk. And uh, uh, I hope there was uh, enough time, you know, to go through a lot of things, you know, but uh, I think you covered that uh, subject so well. Thanks a lot. Uh, our next speaker, uh, we'll leave the question to the end. Uh, we'll have enough time, inshallah, for questions. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Ali Zahrani. Professor Ali Zahrani is a very well-known uh, physician, you know, in the field of endocrinology. And uh, he is famous, you know, in treating patients with uh, thyroid cancer. He is a graduate from King Saud University, and he's obtained his training in uh, John Hopkins uh, Hospital. And uh, he's now a practicing physician at King Faisal Special Hospital and Research Center, where his interest is, in fact, is uh, thyroid cancer and molecular genetics of thyroid cancer. Now he's, you know, uh, holding the job of director of research center at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. Professor Ali, his talk is today is uh, thyroid cancer, differentiated thyroid cancer, 
case based you know discussion uh, dr Ali, professor ali i'll leave the floor for you yes clear ali okay so you see my slides okay so um so thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to talk to you today about thyroid cancer. Uh, I am very delighted to participate in this uh, symposium. A special pleasure for me to uh, be here with two of my close friends, Dr. Saleh al Jasser and Dr. Uh, Anwar Jammah. And I would like to thank Dr. Uh, Nasir Jahani, Dr. Tariq Nasser and their team for inviting us to talk today as part of this uh, wonderful series of uh, thyroid disorders. So um, my talk again is going to be an update on the management. I have uh, around 25 minutes, so hopefully we can cover uh, the essentials. I have nothing to disclose except that some slides are borrowed from Dr. Tatel with his permission. Now, Dr. Jamma already uh, uh, told you about the increasing incidence of thyroid cancer worldwide. This pattern has been witnessed and seen in different places across the world. This is from United States here data showing you that uh, over the last four decades, the thyroid cancer has increased in incidence dramatically. And there is no question that the widespread use of ultrasound and other imaging techniques uh, has contributed significantly to this apparent increase in um, thyroid cancer incidence. You can see that in the 70s in the United States, they used to see around four to five cases per 100,000 per year but currently they are seeing up to 20 actually cases per 100,000 per year. Thyroid cancer is probably the fastest uh, or the, the most um, uh, uh, fast growing uh, uh, cancer among all other cancers. Now, if you look more uh, uh, into the details of this increase, you will find that most of this is small tumors, less than one centimeter that would not be usually detected by hand as Dr. Jamma mentioned, but because of the ultrasound and other imaging techniques, we are detecting lots of this. Around 40 to 50% of those would not have been detected if we don't have ultrasound. Uh, one to two centimeter also increasing, less dramatically than less than one uh, centimeter. But if you look at tumors two to five centimeter, there is no much change over the last several years. And when you look at larger tumor more than five centimeter, the incidence has been stable and the same. And this actually um, uh, suggests strongly that it is really the technology that has led to a, an increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer more than a real increase. Although there are some data suggesting some increase, but I think the dramatic increase is definitely uh, significantly and mainly contributed to by um, the widespread use of imaging techniques. Now, uh, again, as you can see, 50% of all cancers are less than one centimeter, microcarcinomas, and almost 90% are less than two centimeters. So we are dealing with only around 10 to 13% of a real cancer, more than two centimeters, that may lead to uh, recurrence, complication, and death. And therefore, uh, it became clear to many experts in thyroid cancer field that we need to filter those out. We need to know which patient needs to be treated aggressively, usually those with large tumors with lymph node or distant metastasis, and they usually are those in more than two centimeter and, uh, and, and larger, from those that do not need much of intervention or they need limited intervention. So this is the whole change in the management of thyroid cancer. If I, if, the word, uh, if I have to repeat one word tonight, it will be risk-adapted approach. Because prior to 2008, 2007, uh, we used to have a, what is called traditional, traditional paradigm. And that's basically most patients will, will receive to total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine ablation, thyroid hormone suppression, I will be seen frequently every six to 12 months with the same follow-up measures. Uh, people realize that this is not appropriate and we are over-treating many, many patients, those that have tumors that are small and limited to the thyroid. And therefore, the idea or the, the, the concept of risk-adapted paradigm or risk-adapted approach was introduced around 10 years ago. 
Uh, it was actually pioneered mainly by Dr. Tuttle and his uh, group in New York. So instead of one size fits all, we have different sizes and different risk adapted approaches. And uh, we started to adopt more um, uh, limited approaches, what is called minimalist, uh, minimalistic approach. Uh, in other words, more conservative approach, less surgery, less radioactive iodine, less thyroid hormone suppression, less frequent follow-up and less intense follow-up. So this is the whole thing that is becoming actually standard in the management of thyroid cancer. You don't treat your patient the same, you don't treat all your patients the same, assist the risk and uh, implement uh, management strategies based on the risk. If the patient is high risk, then there is no question that these measure total thyroidectomy, radioactive iodine and more are indicated. But if the patient is low risk, which is the case in most patients or intermediate risk, then adjust your approach use more conservative approaches based on the patient risk. Uh, this is actually a, a, a diagram that came from a, re a review article that I was lucky to write with Dr. Tatil around a year ago. And what we emphasized here is that risk stratification is a continuous process. You can see here the risk started actually from the moment you see the patient. When the patient presents to you with a thyroid nodule, you really need to assess the risk of cancer, and if, uh, if the risk is significant, you will uh, do FNA. If you do FNA and it turns out to be cancer, you would have to assess the risk uh, for mortality and for complication and decide whether the patient needs surgery or does not need surgery. Uh, uh, and then if the patient goes for surgery, you see him afterwards around one to two months later, you have now lots of data or information about the patient. Use the AGCC 8th uh, edition to decide what stage is the patient in, and this will predict for you the risk of death. And then you can use the American Thyroid Association risk stratification to predict the risk of recurrence or resistant disease. So you can see again that the word here, the secret word is risk assessment. Then you will be seeing this patient um, uh, repeatedly over time, and every time he comes to you, you should also assess the risk by using what is called response to therapy or dynamic risk stratification, which classifies patients into excellent response, which means more or less remission, biochemically incomplete status, structurally incomplete status, or indeterminate status. And you basically uh, uh, implement measures based on the assessment of the patient at all these different stages. So again, this is a continuous process. From the moment you see the patient immediately after surgery, in every visit that the patient comes to you, you assess his risk uh, for recurrence and for mortality, and you adjust your management measures according to that risk. So with this little background, I would like to go over two cases that illustrate this, and they are actually uh, on the two sides of the, of the spectrum. So this is a 30-year-old lady that I saw around three years ago. She felt a small nodule in the lower neck without any other symptoms, no pressure symptoms. She did not have any family history or past medical history that's significant, no history of external irradiation, and a thyroid ultrasound was done. So this takes us back to the lecture of Dr. Jamah, the risk assessment, the, the multiple, uh, the, the things that we look for, the family history, the external radiation, the size of the nodule. Well, this is her ultrasound. And if you look at this ultrasound, this is a completely normal view. You have the isthmus, you have the left lobe, right lobe, but if you go a little bit down, you see a small nodule in the isthmus around five, sorry, around five millimeter. Uh, if you look at this nodule and uh, remember the diagram that Dr. Jamat showed you, this is a hypoechoic nodule. It has some uh, calcification. The borders are not very clear. So this is actually a high risk nodule. This is likely to be thyroid cancer. Uh, if you apply thyroid system, this will be thyroid 5. But it is a small nodule. This is only 5 millimeter. 
So the question is this. This is the first encounter with the patient. We have to assess the risk. So what is the risk that this is going to be cancer? I think you will all agree that the risk is high, and I will show you in a minute. Next question, what is the risk for the patient? Is this patient going to be harmed by this nodule? Now, Dr. Jamat mentioned to, to you that the recommendation, if the nodule is less than one centimeter, there is no need to do FNA, and that's true for the most part. I intentionally wrote this case to illustrate a point. Guidelines are only guidelines. What is special about this nodule? If this nodule is here in the left thyroid lobe or in the right thyroid lobe, it does not need FNA according to the guideline. But this is a nodule in the isthmus. It is only around two, three millimeter from the trachea. If it increases by two, three millimeter, it may start to invade the trachea. And this is again, a very important concept. Guidelines are not for an guidelines are only guidelines. So this patient, I elected to do FNA. Some of you may not agree on this, but I'm telling you the reason for this. This is not a simple nodule in the middle of the left or right lobe. This is a nodule that is close to a vital structure, the trachea, and therefore uh, we, the risk of malignancy in this nodule is high and should biopsy be done for this pa patient. I elected to do that, and I think that was um, probably the right choice. Now, uh, again, this diagram was shown, or this figure was shown by Dr. Jamah. I just want to compare our nodule to this. Uh, if you look at these different pattern recognition um, uh, images, you can see that this nodule is hypoechoic with a little bit of a regular border calcification. So it is actually in the upper panel, and the upper panel says this is a high risk for malignancy, 70 to 90 percent. So the risk of malignancy here is 70 to 90 percent. They recommend the FNA for nodule more than one centimeter. So I violated this time the guidelines for a good reason that I mentioned it to you. The location of this nodule imposes some risk for this patient. Therefore, FNA was done. Well, it was done. And as you expect, uh, papillary thyroid cancer was diagnosed. So one more time, what is, what is her risk from this cancer? Should we operate on her? Well, the risk for mortality is extremely small. The risk for recurrence is small. Uh, should we operate? Yes, because there is a risk of um, uh, uh, growth and invasion of the trachea. And therefore, yes, I think assessing her risk for uh, complication is, is high and therefore we should operate. So the next question, can we follow her? And as you know, Dr. Tatil and um, other colleagues from Japan uh, pioneered the idea of conservative management and follow-up and observation without intervention. But even Dr. Tatel, if you send him this patient, he will not follow her. He will send her for surgery because of the location. There are preconditions for follow-up. If that nodule is in the middle of a lobe with lots of tissue, normal tissue surrounding it, uh, that would be an ideal patient for follow-up. But this is a nodule that's close to a vital structure and therefore this is not for observation we should operate on this patient. So the next question again, which uh, uh, surgery should we uh, do? Total thyroidectomy or hemithyroidectomy? I think uh, uh, I'm pretty sure most of you would agree that hemithyroidectomy is more than enough for this small tumor. We just need to remove it and the patient will be doing fine. And this is supported by the ATA guidelines saying that if surgery chosen for patients with thyroid cancer less than one centimeter, without extra thyroid extension and without lymph node, the initial procedure should be thyroid lipectomy. And this patient actually fits into this category. They go on to say that thyroid lipectomy alone is sufficient treatment for small unifocal intrathyroidal carcinoma in the absence of prior head and neck irradiation, familial thyroid cancer, or a clinically detectable cervical lymph node. And again, our patient fits in this. So we went ahead and did um, hemithyroidectomy. Remember, she had a nodule in the isthmus. So we removed the left lobe and the isthmus. And the histology uh, just showed five millimeter uh, papillary thyroid carcinoma without lymphovascular invasion, without extrathyroid extension, without lymph node metastasis. 
and the TNM staging is T1A NXMX, which is again very low risk uh, in a young patient like this. So now we are seeing here six to eight weeks after surgery. We have all the information that we have just looked at. Now we need again to risk stratify this patient and we use two systems that are static systems, the ATA risk classification for predicting the risk of recurrence and the AGCC TNM classification for predicting the risk of death. And she is low risk by ATA risk stratification for recurrence. And she is actually stage one by AGCC eighth edition. Therefore her risk of death is very, very low. This is uh, the ATA classification for predicting the risk of recurrence. She is low risk. She has intrathyroidal tumor. She has unifocal uh, papillary microcarcinoma. So her risk of recurrence is only one to 2%, extremely low. She's on the lowest side. So we are not concerned about this patient. If you look at the TNM classification, she is less than 55 years. She has no distant metastasis. So she is stage one and stage one has 10 year survival of more than 98%. So this patient is in a perfect shape. She is low risk from all aspects. She could have been left alone if this nodule was in, in another place in, in the middle of the of a thyroid lobe and observed and, look, and followed up for any change. Uh, so the next question, okay, you're seeing her two months later, you gave her an appointment in maybe six to 12 months. How can, a, can we follow a patient who had only partial thyroidectomy? Uh, we depend a lot on thyroglobulin, we depend on scan, we depend on ultrasound. Can we follow this patient while the right lobe is in, still in place? And the answer is yes, this is no problem. You look actually at the thyroglobulin stability you look at the trend over time, you, look, you use ultrasound initially uh, after six to 12 months and then every three to five years. And those patients do very well. Our TSH target is normal range, lower uh, limit of normal range or lower um, half of normal range. Uh, and then when we send this patient for completion thyroidectomy, if something else appears in the due time, uh, lymph node found in physical examination, ultrasound showing uh, multiple lymph nodes, or you believe the histology is, is, uh, is very high risk uh, and the patient may need radioactive iodine or the thyroglobulin continue to rise over time. But otherwise, you can follow this patient with thyroglobulin. If the thyroglobulin is stable, even if it is uh, mildly elevated, 20 or 30, uh, you don't have to worry about it. It is stable. There is nothing to worry about. And every time we see this patient, we look whether she is in excellent response by chemically incomplete, structurally incomplete, or indeterminate response. I think the definition of all of these are familiar to you. So excellent response means no clinical or biochemical or structural evidence of disease. Biochemically incomplete means the thyroglobulin is high or TG antibody are rising but there is no structural disease that we can see on ultrasound or other imaging technique. And structurally incomplete, um, that's basically when you find uh, a disease and you do FNAs positive or seat scan is showing you uh, lung metastasis. And indeterminate is non-specific biochemical or structural findings, which cannot be confidently classified as either benign or malignant. Uh, now, if the patient is an excellent response, which is the case in this patient, the risk of recurrence is very small, one to 4%. The risk of death is less than 1%. And therefore you don't have to follow those patients very um, frequently. You can just use thyroglobulin every year or every other year and ultrasound every two to three years. Uh, if the patient has biochemically incomplete, 30% uh, of them will spontaneously resolve. 20 will develop structural disease. We observe those patients. We look at thyroglobulin over time and thyroglobulin antibody. We do ultrasound usually every six to 12 months. If we detect the disease, we biopsy it and we act accordingly. Their risk of death is still low. Structurally incomplete is where the problems happen. Those are patients with residual disease or recurrent disease and 50 to 85% of them will have persistent disease despite even additional surgeries or radioactive iodine. 
And most of the problem happen in this category. Nearly all deaths from thyroid cancer happen in this category. Therefore, this category will need closer follow-up and uh, more uh, instigations and more intervention. Indeterminate is just a slight elevation in thyroglobulin or uh, positive antibodies or some nanospecific uh, ultrasonographic features. Again, most of those patients will go to excellent response over time. You don't have to act very uh, uh, aggressively with those patients. The risk of death is low. You need to observe them over time, give them some TSH uh, suppression, but you don't have to worry so much about them unless they show some signs of, um, of recurrence or progression. So I think this case illustrates many, many points about thyroid cancer, the risk stratification concept, how to um, uh, act, how to uh, follow those patients, uh, how to decide on the uh, type of surgery, type of follow-up, radioactive iodine or no radioactive iodine, et cetera. Let's take another case that's probably on the other side of the, of the coin uh, to illustrate um, uh, the concept further. So this is uh, another patient that uh, I saw in 2010. He was 21 years old at that time. He came with multiple lower neck swellings. Uh, his ultrasound shows 1.6 centimeter right hypoechoic nodule and several pathological lymph nodes. So I think you already can observe that this is a different patient from the young woman who had five millimeter uh, ismic uh, uh, nodule. This is his ultrasound. Again, this is a nodule in the isthmus. Uh, it is a regular hypoechoic, uh, highly sus suspicious. This is thyroid five. You can see even protrusion of this nodule outside the thyroid. And you can see a lymph node here that is suspicious. Uh, you can see on the sagittal view here again that this nodule is uh, hypoechoic with, uh, with irregular bo borders. So obviously this is a highly suspicious nodule and I don't think any of us would doubt the need for fine needle aspiration. Again, assessing the risk of this nodule, the risk is high. Should we do FNA? I, I believe the answer is yes. FNA was done, patient had papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, what type of surgery this patient should should do. I think we all agree with the presence of lymphadenopathy that this patient should undergo thyroidectomy plus minus bilateral neck dissection because he has many pathological lymph nodes. He actually underwent total thyroidectomy and bilateral neck dissection. And as you can see in his pathology, he had classic papillary thyroid carcinoma, multifocal. The largest was 1.6 centimeter, but it was bilateral. There was no extrathyroidal extension, no lymphovascular invasion, but 34 out of 63 lymph nodes uh, removed were, were, were positive. So this is a patient with extensive uh, metastatic lymphadenopathy. In fact, he came two months later and he's still having several lymph nodes and he went for another clearance of his neck and 13 out of 24 lymph nodes were positive, some of them with extranodal extension um, uh, which is a bad sign. So I think you can see from the description of this patient that he has extensive lymphadenopathy. This is not a low risk patient. This is at least intermediate risk, if not high risk. So if you look at the ATA um, scheme here, uh, this patient is actually a patient who has um, uh, um, BN1, some lymph node more than three centimeter. And you can see the risk of recurrence in this patient is up around 30%. So this is a patient between the intermediate to high grade, and he is definitely at a very high risk of uh, recurrence, as you will see in a minute. What about his TNM classification? His TNM classification is stage one because he does not have metastasis and he is less than 55. So his risk of mortality is not high, but his risk of recurrence is very high. Does he need iodine-131? I am also sure that all of you agree that this patient should receive radioactive iodine. This is from the ATA guidelines regarding the, uh, the uh, iodine treatment or radioactive iodine treatment. So in short, if the patient is low risk, no need for radioactive iodine. If he is high risk, there is need for radioactive iodine. If he is intermediate risk, then you have to consider and decide. You use your clinical judgment. Obviously, this patient is on the intermediate to high side. So definitely, I will give him radioactive iodine. 
and this was the case. This is his pre-therapy scan. You can see the information at that time. His TG was 23.6, but he had TG antibody more than 4,000. He was stimulated at that time with a TSH 114. He received 155 millicurie, and you can see the post-therapy scan showing a lot of disease in his neck. Um, uh, six month, this is uh, in April 2011. Six months later, uh, he came, or eight, eight months later, he came with a, a repeat CT, with a repeat scan, which was reported to be negative, but TG was still elevated, although the antibodies were positive. Ultrasound uh, were um, clear uh, in the bed, but showed submandibular hypervascular lymph node, which was here, you can see it with a very highly suspicious lymph node, FNA was done, and this was papillary thyroid cancer. So this is a patient with persistent disease. Uh, we went ahead and did another surgery. So this is the third surgery, and he has three out of three lymph node positives. So he has a structural disease. And um, those are the patients who do not do well, as I mentioned. You can see here, if you again use the dynamic risk stratification, if a patient is an excellent response, 96% of them continue to have no evidence of disease in seven years or more. Actually, we just had a, 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 a manuscript uh, uh, showing even better uh, numbers than this. Uh, if he has indeterminate, 87% of them will continue to have no disease uh, over a long time. If it is biochemically incomplete, around 70% will have no evidence of disease, but some of them will have persistent biochemical disease, and some of them will have structural disease. Our patient falls in this category. He has structurally incomplete disease, so his risk of death is actually around 40%. Uh, his risk of structural disease around 40%. Uh, his risk of being free or his, his chance of being free of the disease is only 15%. As I mentioned, if this is the category of patients who do not do well, the structurally incomplete patients. Well, going back to the patient, uh, around six months later, uh, he had another scan and uh, it was reported to be negative. And I'm putting question mark because if you look at the, the, the lungs, they show some background activity. His TG at that time was even uh, higher, but again, in the presence of TG antibody, you cannot make much out of that. Um, and he received another dose of radioactive iodine, uh, and that was reported to show on the post-therapy scan diffuse lung disease, and you can see it here with diffuse lung metastasis. In fact, the CT scan that was done a few months later showed extensive uh, lung metastasis, as you can see in the background. Unfortunately, the patient was lost for follow-up for three years, and he came back with larger uh, lung metastasis, as you can see here. And it, you can see also in the PET scan that those not many of those nodules are positive, and this is not a very good sign. PET positive disease is more aggressive and has uh, worse prognosis than PET negative disease. Uh, this is in December 2017, and uh, we did not do anything at that time. We just suppressed him with thyroxin. Uh, we wanted to observe what will happen to those nodules. In September 2018, you can see the nodule has increased farther, and uh, uh, I counseled him at that time to use tyrosine kinase inhibitors but he wanted to try one more dose of uh, radioactive iodine, and uh, although I was not very happy with that, but that's the patient choice and that has to be uh, respected. So we receive another large dose of radioactive iodine and in fact, on the post-therapy scan, there is some diffuse uptake in the lungs. Uh, CT scan uh, in December, 2018 is still showing large macro metastasis. Uh, and this is actually radioactive iodine refractory progressive thyroid cancer because although there is some uptake, uh, the disease continued to progress. And uh, this is a, a case to be considered for tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Uh, now, in the next few slides, I'll just talk about this modality of treatment. You know that understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of thyroid cancer resulted in production of large number of tyrosine kinase inhibitors. 
for differentiated thyroid cancer, we have sorafenib and lipatinib uh, being approved by FDA and are widely used. So um, this is a sorafenib uh, trial, the, the decision trial showing you improvement in progression three survival if you use uh, sorafenib versus placebo, 11 months versus six months. And this is lipatinib uh, select trial showing you again an improvement in the progression-free survival to around 18 months versus four months in the placebo. This patient uh, started on lympatinib in March 2019. He had some side effects, as you all know, uh, hand foot syndrome, diarrhea, and weight loss, but they were all mild and manageable. You can see his CT scan before lympatinib showing large nodules, and four months later, you can see most of those disappeared. So this is very impressive res response, actually. Again, this is pre-therapy, and this is four months after therapy, and he's continuing up till this time on lymphatinib, and he's doing fine. So to conclude, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer is remarkably increasing in incidence. Uh, most cases are low risk for recurrence and death, but a significant portion can be high risk, like our second patient, causing morbidity and mortality, and they need to be treated very aggressively or very proactively in contrast to low-risk patients who can be managed very conservatively. The contemporary approach for management is based on risk assessment. Risk assessment is really the secret word that you should adopt in your um, uh, encounters with patients at all stages, from brief therapy all the way till the last uh, uh, visit. Risk assessment is a dynamic process that changes over time. For low-risk patients, you can uh, uh, be very conservative and follow minimalistic uh, approach. For high-risk patients, you need to be very proactive. So your task is really to be able to dissect high-risk patients from low-risk patients and uh, act accordingly. Intermediate-risk patients can be um, uh, the therapy can be individualized based on the level of risk and change uh, strategy based on the dynamic risk stratification over time. And with that, I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ali, for an excellent talk and a clear you know, approach to management of thyroid cancer. Uh, uh, now the floor is open for uh, questions. Uh, I have two questions for Dr. Anwar. The first question is, what's the significance of T3 and or T4 in regard to the thyroid nodule? And what is the difference between T3 and T4? Uh, I'm just, you know, telling you what's sent to me by, by the audience. So this is the first question, Dr. Anwar. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I did not go over anything about... Uh, uh, T3 in management of or decreasing the size of thyroid nodule. I, I, I never no T, T3 uh, and T4 levels, not uh, treatment. Ah, a T3 and T4 level of of, of what the risk or yeah, and, and uh, the significance of T3 and T4 levels in regard to thyroid nodule are they important? I don't know. I don't know. I, okay. I did not go uh, across anything. Is the the risk was associated with TSH? Okay. All right. Uh, the second it's, question it's is, uh, is and, uh, more stable too. Yes. Yeah. The next question, in fact, is a very general question, and I don't know if uh, the you know whoever you know asked the question listened to the lecture. It was answered beautifully. He said, "When do you consider FNA for a thyroid nodule?" Uh, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, more than one cent, uh, less than one centimeter. I I, I don't usually do uh, more than one centimeter uh, if, if there is a high risk feature, and uh, if there is a moderate risk, or maybe pure cyst or uh, or mixed or sponge form, I do it more than two centimeter. Um, I agree with Dr. Ali. There is even with less than one centimeter and high risk feature that uh, sometimes you may do it for the less than one centimeter but i i, I rarely do any fna less than one centimeter lately um maybe this is this is a point to discuss maybe with dr ali if he's with me now uh in regard of this uh 0.5 centimeter i i think if 
if you have a good surgeon, uh, uh, a good hospital, a good care, you can send patient for uh, for surgery of less than zero. If you have a nodule 0.5 centimeter, uh, you do a and you send for surgery. Um, but but I, I, I may have one or two patients in the clinic. They did the surgery for less than one centimeter uh, nodule, and they have their surgery outside Riyadh, and they are uh, they have persistent hypocalcemia, and one of them they have uh, hoarseness of his voice uh, for the last uh, maybe ten years. Uh, so uh, yeah, this uh, maybe if you have a good surgeon, a good hospital, you you may send for the patient. But if, if you have no good surgeon or the complication is high, maybe I'll, I, I, I will not uh, do FNA or send patient for surgery if less than one centimeter nodule. If, if I can Thank comment. You. Please, Ali. So, so I don't want uh, to, send, to, to send the wrong message. The guidelines are very accurate in general, and as Dr. Ranwar mentioned, in general, we don't need to do FNA for nodule less than one CP. I think I, uh, I brought this case to illustrate the point that um, first guidelines are guidelines and they don't replace clinical judgment. And this is actually a disclosure at the beginning of the guidelines. If you read the guidelines very carefully, they will tell you that these are guidelines and do not replace your clinical judgments. Second thing, uh, not all less than one centimeter nodules are the same. The patient that I presented is a patient who has five millimeter in the isthmus and close to a vital structure. So when would I uh, do FNA? I will do FNA for nodule more than one centimeter based on the guidelines of the American Thyroid Association or the thyroid system. But for nodule less than one centimeter, I will do FNA if they are close to vital structure or they are associated with lymphadenopathy, pathological lymphadenopathy. Even if it is three millimeter or four millimeter, but there is a pathological lymph node, this patient is already showing you that he or she is having aggressive tumor or a tumor that has um, a tendency to metastasize if it is thyroid cancer. And therefore, these are the two scenarios that I will do FNA for nodule less than one centimeter. But otherwise, I will not do FNA for nodule less than one centimeter. So close to vital structures, like our patient, and lymph no uh, associated with lymph node, uh, pathological lymph node. I want to mention one additional important point. People sometimes do FNA and it is benign or the nodule is less than one centimeter and they do, don't do FNA and they dismiss the patient. Follow-up is extremely important. We, the management of thyroid nodule is not FNA. FNA is just part of the management. So if I do FNA and it is benign, remember there is a false negative uh, margin for any, F, for any procedure, including FNA at least once or twice I would see this patient with a, a follow-up ultrasound to make sure that I did not miss cancer and falsely reassure the patient. Thank you very much, uh, Anwar and Ali. Uh, question for Dr. Ali. Maybe I have three questions, if you allow me. The first one is, in fact, uh, a 50-year-old female with solitary thyroid nodule who has a suppressed TSH, but there is no available thyroid scan to perform. What would you, how would you proceed with this patient? Okay, so if the, T, if the TSH is, uh, okay, so what are the possible scenarios in this patient? The possible scenario is that this is a toxic adenoma and is the reason for suppressed TSH. Second scenario, this is a patient with the Graves disease and the nodule is cancer. Uh, and the patient has mild background Graves disease. Uh, uh, and a third scenario is that this is actually Graves disease and this is a benign uh, note. Uh, I don't think, honestly, there is any way to sort this out short of having the scan. If you don't have it in your place, you need to send it um, somewhere else. If you don't have this possibility at all, then I think you need to treat the patient with antithyroid medication 
and follow the patient with a repeat ultrasound maybe six to nine months to make sure that this nodule is not increasing. If it is increasing, then you may want to actually to do FNA. I will not do FNA initially, uh, especially if it is a small nodule, uh, because if it is toxic adenoma, it can give you a confusing cytology. But if the nodule continue to increase and I have no way of doing a scan, then I will do FNA after some time. Okay, the second question, in fact, is uh, a 30 years old female who underwent total diarectomy for multinodular waiter. Histopathology shows multicentric microscopic papillary CA with uh, no lymphovascular invasion and no extrathyroidal extension, but there was three out of 13 lymph nodes positive. How would you stratify this patient? So, this patient has actually low intermediate risk disease, okay? So in other words, uh, the, not, the lymph node are, are uh, only three, but there might be additional lymph node. Uh, if we want to be strictly following the guidelines, then I will ask the, the one who asked the question, what is uh, the size of this uh, metastasis? If it is less than two millimeter, it is, uh, it is a low risk. If it is more than two millimeter, it is intermediate risk. Collectively, based on what was said, I think this patient is in the low intermediate uh, stage, and I will uh, uh, surgery should be uh, sh uh, surgery is already done. So the next question: Should we give this patient radioactive iodine? I think that's subject to controversy. If the thyroglobulin is still high, or there is some suspicious uh, finding on ultrasound uh, that was done postoperatively, I will give her radioactive iodine. If the thyroglobulin is quite low, there is nothing suspicious, then you may elect just to follow her without uh, radioactive. Thank you so much, Ali. The last question, in fact, how would you explain the rise of the prevalence of thyroid cancer in Saudi Arabia? So I, th I think it is similar to many other places. I think there is no question. Th the whole question across the world is this is the only reason for the increase in thyroid cancer, the widespread use of imaging techniques, or there is a real increase. Uh, this uh, issue continue to be uh, unanswered conclusively. There is no question that the imaging technique, as, as was sh uh, shown by Dr. Jamah in the Korean experience, is, is a ma major reason. The question, is there, in addition to the widespread use of imaging technique, uh, a real increase in thyroid cancer? Um, maybe it is. Maybe there is. There are some data actually coming from the United States recently, from California and other places, suggesting that there is an, addition, an increase in the thyroid cancer incidence, not only because of imaging, but also there is an increase, a real increase. And the, uh, and the evidence for this is that there is also increase in that series of large tumor, not only small tumors. So large tumors uh, should be detected easily by hand. And therefore, the fact that large and small tumors both increase in incidence suggests to them that this is a, there is some real increase in addition to the widespread use of uh, ultrasound. So Saudi Arabia is similar. I think we are increasing in population. That's number one. Second thing, we are using imaging technique right and left. And I think the, the one who, uh, who, who asked the question is, is, is probably also raising the possibility that the wars that happened around us, the first Gulf War, second Gulf War may have contributed to this. It is possible. We have seen an increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer after 1990s and after 2000s. But again, uh, we are not sure if this is related to the wars or just because we are increasing uh, in, in population size and we are using more uh, imaging techniques. Thank you so much, uh, both speakers, uh, Dr. Anwar Jamah, Dr. Ali. It was an excellent program, and my thanks would be extended to uh, the Saudi Thyroid Society for having an excellent program, and special thanks to the organizer. Dr. Tarek Nasr and Dr. Nasr Al Johani. Thank you all, and we should see you in the next meeting, inshallah. Thank you very much. Shukran Saleh.